Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon in the virtual space to share with the Department of Geography and Geology as we host yet another brown bag seminar. Today's brown bag seminar is presented by Dr. Arpita Mandal, and it is entitled Water in a Changing Climate, a Jamaican Story. But this story is told to us by a storyteller who originated from India. Dr. Mandal is a senior lecturer in hydrology and hydrogeology in the Department of Geography and Geology at the University of the West Indies. She's an adjunct senior lecturer in engineering hydrology at the Department of Civil Engineering. Well, no, the Faculty of Engineering at the University of the West Indies. She's been teaching here since September 2006. And so she's no stranger to Jamaica and that is going to show in her presentation where she's able to tell the Jamaican story about water. Um, she teaches water resources, hydrology, hydrological modeling, engineering hydrology and geophysics. Her research focuses on hydrological modeling, climate change and the impact of flood risk as well as water resources. She's worked on many projects um, funded by the Climate Development Knowledge Network from the UK, the World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank, among others. She's also been involved collaboratively with the Climate Studies Group of UE Mono, um, UE Cave Hill, and St. Augustine. Her research associates mm -hmm. are also from the East Tennessee State University and the Ghent University in Belgium. Um, for her expertise, She's also a technical member of the Global Water Partnership of the Caribbean. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mandal, my colleague, to give today's presentation. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Tira, for the introduction. Uh, yes, my work is not my alone. It's a collaborative work. I work with colleagues from chemistry as well, um, chemistry, physics and my own department. So it's all a collaborative project and I'm going to show you some of the highlights of what I do since some people were asking me if they don't know what I do, aside from posting pictures on Facebook, just joking. Yeah, so let's get on with what I do and I'm going to tell you about my research, what we've been doing so far in context to climate change. It's a little technical because my background is purely technical. So I'm going to be more on the technical side. And I'll try to keep within the time limit. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? I shared my screen. Can you see it? Yes, sir. All right. So I'm starting from, I don't know why it's not. Why it got cut off? One second, the slide title got cut off. No, it's okay now. All right, so I'm going to talk about the challenges in the water sector with the impact of climate change and the different aspects of too much water and too little water, the two extremes of the hydrological cycle. Now, this picture is very familiar to Kingstonians and um, I've purposely put up this picture because the impact of the shortage of water is felt mostly in Kingston and St. Andrew, partly for various reasons. One, limited resources and more demand. So I'm just giving you some graphics of where we get our water from. Most of us in this chat room, in the, in the session are aware, but just for our knowledge, so this is the polygon which you see over here in orange is the Hope River watershed just east of uh, east of the um, Ligony Alluvium Plain. And the pin mark you see over here is the Hope River intake. That is where the intake is from for the for the Mona Reservoir. And from there. I don't know why it's stuck. 
Okay, it was stuck. So from there it goes, that's the intake picture and you can see the picture on a normal dry day, very, very little water. And you'll see the another picture when you have too much water in it. And from there it goes to the Mona Reservoir via pipelines and treated and finally comes to a tap. That is how the supply chain is from the mountains, from the rivers, through the, uh, through the intake and then to the Mona Reservoir and then to the pipelines. I don't know why the screenshot is, uh, the changing of the slides taking a little bit time. So our outline of the talk, I'm going to give you a brief overview on what is sustainable development goal and which one we are considering when we look at water for the water sector, then the water resources in Jamaica, some of the climate model predictions for Jamaica, especially related to rainfall and um, intensity of storms and hurricanes, the work which is going on in the Department of Geography and Geology, myself and collaboration with others, and your dis recommendation, discussions, and finally, the acknowledgements. Now, this is a couple of years of work I'm trying to show today. Now, we are all talking about sustainable development goals, and every country must meet these SDG goals by uh, 2050. By, um, and but what are these SDG goals? These are different goals set by the United Nations and in 2020, 2010, sorry, and there are different goals for different sectors. Now, my work, although it is not works in isolation, water is the um, SDG six, but in six you have different subsections like clean water sanitation, water availability, and it also works with goal 15, line, life on land, climate action, the demand for water has been increasing at a rate of about 1% per year. That's from the UN World Water Report. And we can see, especially in Kingston, where we are living in a short geographical space, the demand for water is, will increase. If your urbanization increases, it's a very linear equation. Your urbanization increases, the demand will always increase and the resource is limited. So how are we going to tackle this solution? The global water cycle is also intensifying due to climate change. We have the two extremes, the dry and the wet phase, too much water and too little water affecting us on a day-to-day -day basis. We have water wetter regions becoming wetter and drier regions becoming drier. And that is not good for any sectors that use water. All right, so water is our basic right. And as I suggest, as I referred I call, as after the UN General Assembly resolution, it was came out, suggested that it, uh, everybody should have access to clean, safe, accessible, affordable drinking water. And there is a challenge to meet that for every country. Now, just some brief overview on the uh, water crisis. Now, why do we have water crisis? If you look at the different um, figures over here, how much fresh water are we dealing with? 2.5%. Much of the water is locked in the oceans. Yes, it is essential to life and sustainable living. We need clean water supplies, vital for energy, agriculture, but we have very little to deal with. Of that fresh water, groundwater is, is present in the maximum 30% is groundwater and surface of fresh water is very little. So we are little dealing with the very little water and too much, more, too many people to supply that water. When you talk about water resource and water supply, we have to understand Water resource involves the total amount of water which is available for human use for all the sectors. How much is available for both domestic water supply, domestic um, sector, agriculture, and industry. In Jamaica, agriculture is the major uh, sector which consumes water and I'll show you, except the parish of Kingston and St. Andrew, the, all the other hydrological basins and parishes use agriculture. Agriculture is the dominant uh, sector which needs water. Water supply involves the water that has been treated and thus becomes drinking water. 
But again, this also, I would consider not only the one which we water supply that we get in the pipelines, it's the supply coming all the way back from the rivers. So it's not just the tap water, which of course, if you trace a source, it has to go back to a well or it has to go back to a river. It can be surface or groundwater. What affects our water supply? Accessibility. How close are we to the location of the water resource? How affordable is it is? Can we afford to pay the price to get the water? And availability, do we have enough water? And with climate change and other factors affecting it, how long is this sustainable? Now coming to the Jamaican context of it, um, everybody here are fam is familiar where we are located, but just to give an idea, we are located just south of Cuba and is the third largest island in the Caribbean. We have a tropical maritime climate. Our temperatures range from 26 degrees in February, low to high 28 and 33, even 38, 39 in last two, three years in summer, we have seen temperatures going up to 38, 39 degrees. Last year, this year, not so much, but last year, definitely one or two days, we recorded very, very high temperature in one station uh, in Kingston. And island-wide, the long-term annual rainfall, we have a bimodal rainfall pattern with uh, two peaks, one in the months of September, October, and the other in the months of um, May, late April, uh, May, June. What is our primary source of water? I'm just going to, one second. There is some problem with sharing the slides. So maybe the internet, so I'll hide the video. So rainfall is our primary source of water. And Jamaica's freshwater resources come from both surface, that is rivers and streams, underground sources, wells and springs, and from rainwater harvesting, which is not ideally going at that rate it should be. We should have more rainwater harvesting, but that's a separate issue. So according to the reports from Water Resource Authority and the state of the Jamaica climate and research is done here, Groundwater approximately represents 84% of the island's exploitable water and accounts for 92% of the groundwater of the water that is supplied for agriculture, industry, and domestic purposes. Now, if you look at the rainfall map and the population uh, density map of Jamaica, it is just from a bird's eye and overall observation, it is very easy to correlate why we have a uh, first-hand knowledge of the inequality or the disproportion in the water resource availability. In the 30-year mean annual rainfall mass, we have, what do we see? We see based on, if we just hold on to the rainfall as the main source of water, you will see that the Southern coast of Jamaica, uh, mainly the parishes of the Southern part of uh, Rio, um, St. Catherine, Kingston, St. Andrew, as well as um, Clarendon is very dry because this is lies in the rain shadow of the Blue Mountain, Blue Mountain and the Blue Mountain um, North Basin, which is primarily comprising of the parishes of St. Mary and Portland, you see a dark blue patch rainfall going approximately 6,900 meters because most of the rainfall is over there and you have a large, um, uh, intensity of rainfall and you have a high density of surface water because of the presence of the underlying geology, basal aquiclude, volcanics, volcanoclastic rocks in Portland, very little permeability, less of groundwater in the, uh, less of groundwater and more surface waters. If you look at the population density map, can you correlate the two in terms of availability, demand and supply? Yes, you can. The population density is highest in the Kingston and St. Andrew were greater than 700,000 uh, according to the 2011, I think the stat statin data. Uh, majority of course we know is in Kingston, St. Andrew, dark brown patch and look at the rainfall, very, very low rainfall. So you have low rainfall and more people 
glory so small people so there is a clear before even you start we start on climate change and everything there is an inequality in the distribution of water based on the natural physiography and the topography and where people are living now if you look at the hydrostrata of Jamaica, hydrostratigraphy of Jamaica, which is based on the geology, now the geology map is being revised and I don't, I'm not showing the geology part here in detail. Um, my colleague can attest, attend to those questions. I see him here, but um, this is the basic geology classification based on which the stratigraphy is there. So you have the two parishes, Kingston, Portland and St. Mary and the upper St. Andrew, right from um, if you know where Papine is, and if you follow the road all the way going up to Irish Town, Mavis Bank, if you have driven or walked up that road, all the rocks you see on the left hand, on the right is the precipice, you see the Rio, uh, the Hope River, and if you've driven up, all the brown area is the rocks on the left where you see a lot of landslides happening after a heavy, heavy rain, and those are the basal aquiclute, which is predominantly impermeable, non-porous rock where you cannot store groundwater, you have a high intensity of surface water. So the primary hydrostrat units are basal aquiclodes, explaining in simple words, the brown part is the basal aquiclode. The next one here, you have the central in Lyre that is running from southeast of Trelawney, going all the way to St. Catherine, Upper Clarendon. You have one in the Hanover, uh, side uh, and then a little bit in St. James. So wherever you get Cretaceous rocks, 65 million years, Cretaceous, I'm just keeping it simple. No, there are many here, uh, not from geology, though, just to keep it simple. So, 65 million years starts the start onset of Cretaceous. So Cretaceous rocks, impermeable, not porous, uh, does not allow infiltration of water to be stored in a uh, in a reservoir that is uh, aquiclode. The yellow section, 85% is the cast highly fractured limestone aquifer. And you have 15% is the alluvial material, which is the pink one over here, the, which is on the floodplains of the major river systems in St. Catherine. You see them in the Rio Cobre floodplain, you have in the Ligony alluvium, you have the floodplains of the Plantain Garden River, Yalas River, Swift River, Spanish River in the Northeast, uh, Black River is coastal aquiclode of, 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 of so, and you have some limestone aquiclode down the top. Now, watersheds in Jamaica. Now, if you compare the rainfall and the elevation and the watersheds on the left, we have the elevation map from Jamaica and we have overlain the rivers on it. And if you see here, the eastern side again, because of the rock type, you have high density of rivers. And if you look on rainfall, high rainfall intensity over in the eastern part of the island. Now, the different basins of Jamaica. Jamaica has 10 hydrological basins. And if um, this data is from the Water Resources Master Plan, and um, comparing the overall um, rainfall, evaporation, groundwater discharge from the different basins versus the size. Kingston is the smallest in terms of size, but it is the highest population. And rainfall, if we look on the bar graphs, rainfall is of course low, evaporation is low, everything is low, groundwater discharge is also very low, and surface water is very low. So we have a critical problem here, not before we add climate change to it, we have a distribution problem because the, how the land is, how the topography is, and how people live, there is a disproportion. You have the largest basin uh, is the, um, is the Blue Mountain North Basin, that is the St. Mary and uh, Portland. And if you look here, very, very high rainfall, you have a lot of water over there. Again, there is a challenge of bringing that water from there to Kingston. Is it feasible? Can we build pipelines to over the hills and bring them to Kingston to supply us when we need? What are the engineering challenges? Those are other issues we can discuss later on. Now, I did this based on, this was from a study which I did with Dr. Raini back in the days, a uh, couple of years back, and we looked at the uh, water availability. Now in Kingston, you'll see over here, we have maximum demand is in the domestic sector. Whereas in the other basins, uh, if you look, 
is agriculture dominates. Rio Cobre agriculture, Rio Mino agriculture, everywhere is agriculture, whereas in Kingston, of course, Kingston is highly urbanized. We don't have a lot of agriculture here that needs water. Now, what are the climate change impacts? We are talking about climate change. We are talking about the Paris Agreement 1.5 to stay alive, and we must meet these goals, X number of goals, and there are various reports. But what are the different impacts we see on a day-to-day -day life? Increase in temperature, one of the offsets of, of, of one of the deliverables from outcomes of climate change, increase in temperature. Decrease in daily rainfall. How much is increase in temperature? Up to one degree, what will happen? Up to two degree, up to three degree, and everybody is studying with it, but I am only concerned, I'm only looking at the water part, I'm not looking at the other, it's not beyond my scope. So increase in temperature of the Earth's oceans, increase in greenhouse gases lead to a warmer climate. Now, what do you have of that? Now, in the context, current scenario, we are looking at different RCP scenarios. These are representative concentrated pathways. Keeping simple, these are coming out of different global climate models which have taken into account different uh, forcing factors like, okay, if the temperature increases by, if the sea surface temperature increases, if the um, humidity increases, if the rainfall increases on a global climate basis, um, different models done, and then you downscale it to regional climate, and then you use that, so use a gridded data and you try to run your impact sector modeling. There are limitations, and I, although I do this, I will say there are strong limitations on that, but this is how we must do. We cannot just sit and say we don't have data, we don't do, we have to do with what we have. So RCP 2.6 looks at a change in average temperatures um, from 86 to 85, that's, and then there are baseline from for 30 years. So population growth and climate change two main drivers. And we are in Jamaica looking at the three RCP scenarios. So what will be the change in average precipitation? I'm looking just at the precipitation part of it. So how does climate change impact our water? It will impact in too much rainfall or too little rainfall. So when you have too much rainfall, you have flooding, excess storm water runoff, sediments load in the rivers, you have back-to-back -back rainfall events, you have a lot of sediment load in the river channels, which again, decrease your channel area with causing flooding, damage to agriculture on the sides of the river banks, loss to life and housing. When you have too less rainfall, it will impact your, it will cause water stress, less availability, water quality will get affected because you're, you will have saline intrusion, along coastal aquifers, again, if you have fractures and falls for allowing the water to get in, then with sea level rise and saline intrusion, your fresh water and salt water mixes up and you, you, when you're pumping the water out of the well, you have more uh, chloride content in it or high conductivity and you could shut down the well, which means if you have 10 wells, you shut down four, you are limited to six wells, adding to water stress. So it's all related. Food security, once you have short water, less water, you cannot plant certain crops. Your supply chain gets affected. So cost of food goes up, health, dengue, and other waterborne diseases. So everything is related together. So variability in temperature, variability in sea surface temperature, variability in um, frequency and intensity of hurricanes and tropical storms. And the outcomes are flood, droughts, saline water intrusion in coastal aquifers. I'm just going to skip this slide because this is again uh, um, some of the items from too much or too little water. Now let's go into some of the climate model predictions for Jamaica. So what are the impacts of climate change for small island states? Flooding from excess rainfall and the areas which are already in, I mean, the low-lying floodplains of the major river systems, which will, which are affected now, will also get affected. And these are Hope, Yalas, Outram River is where Port Maria is located. So Port Maria is located on the mouth of the Outram River. You have another one, Paji. 
You have Anato Bay, the mouth of the Anato Bay River gets flooded up. Rio Grande, example, which are sites of major towns and cities. Rio Cobre, where 60% of the population are at risk. Then in the past, we have seen from Hurricane Ivan, if I remember, 2004, damage to Caribbean terrace, which was again a coastal community from storm surge. And then you also have from in Portland Cottage and Rocky Point. And this will also affect your tourism sector. Now, if you look at here, the data, the table at the bottom, the above are some compilation of data from different um, reports and studies we have done. Uh, frequency of flood disasters from 2000, in the last 10 decade, year decade was twice than the preceding one. And the table you see at the bottom was compiling the damages to the different sectors from flooding. And we have, this is basically from PIOJ and ECLAC reports. And I have seen that Hurricane Ivan in 2004 uh, caused the major damage and major dam damage was to housing, bridges and roads. That is, and the next is, um, which can be comparable is Gustav, which was a tropical storm and uh, tropical storm Nicole. But still, Hurricane Ivan ranks Gilbert was, of course, in 1988, but I did not go that far. This is from Michelle, which is 2000, Denise, Emily, and from the last decade, I looked at it. Now, models are artificially, you generate projections for the future, looking in the historical rainfall data, historical from the different scenarios, uh, temperature increasing, population increasing, uh, rainfall increasing, and then you fit it into a global model and you say, what will the future look like? Data driven, of course, you need to have significant amount of historical data to do the future. In the previous years, it was the stress scenarios. And we had the different storylines, A1, E2, B1, B2, which looked at a conservative world of uh, rapid economic growth. I'm not going to go into the physics of all that, I'm going to show you the, what we do. We take the outputs of the climate model. So these are the different RCP scenarios for Jamaica from the state of the climate, Jamaica climate, and all of them are showing an increase in temperature. So my work now was to use the rainfall data from the climate models, and the climate models are showing uh, annual cycle, um, a decadal cycle with North Caribbean and Eastern Caribbean variability pattern. We also seeing our uh, total rainfall going down, but the intense rainfall are increasing. And we are also seeing a drying trend overall, which means more drought, but uh, increase in the frequency of hurricanes and tropical storms. some of the studies which was done. Now, what is the implication? Increase in number of dry days, less available water resources. And how do we quantify it? So we started this quantification work of the decreasing trend in the water sector from a research done in last two, one and a half year or two. Look at the frequency of flood and landslides and hurricanes. Now, this is a report which is from the Rainy et al. 2018, looking on the implication of 1.5. And we have seen for different, we're seeing here for temperature difference between the different RCP scenarios. The eastern, eastern part of the island showing a drying trend, which means the uh, basins of Blue Mountain North, the parishes of um, Portland, St. Mary, Kingston, they are all going to see a drying trend. In all, the same with the rainfall, you are going to see a uh, decrease in the rainfall trend. Now we looked at the, this is research done started since last, uh, some of it was doing going on as a, a PhD student of mine, uh, Ms. Curtis, and some we added from the project we are still doing, State of the Jamaica Climate. So we are looking at the Rio Cobre, water resources in the Rio Cobre Basin. Why Rio Cobre? Because we were, we've, um, if any water from the Rio Cobre can be used to offset the water resource, a uh, water resource problem in Kingston. Now I've shown you a schematic of the Kingston Basin. So in Kingston, you have Yalas and Hope River and the 
Wagwater River, which is draining into the reservoirs. And then you have two storage facilities and a few wells. Now, water from the Rio Cobra is not stored, but is treated and supplied directly from wells, five to eight limestone wells. So you have the upper Rio Cobre, which is just the pink part that's up above the gorge, and you have the lower Rio Cobre. So the work we did, now here I just added, uh, is to look at if you have different climate scenarios, how will the flow in the Rio Cobre behave for a one, for a RCP 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5, to put in simple words. Not just by saying that the Rainfall increase, decreasing, meaning stream flow will decrease. Yes, it will. But is there a way to quantify that? Now, you can see that clearly the impacts of climate change, impacts of too much and too little. Same spot taken at two times. The right one, I had taken it, and the left one is from the newspaper archive. The right one is the dry state of the Hope River. And after two days of heavy rain, you see the condition of the water and the turbidity and all of this is wasted. This just goes, runs off and causes flooding. So the challenges to Kingston is limited surface water, water scarcity, contamination of the groundwater because of limited, uh, and which further limits it and which affects water and sanitation. So just to give you an overview of the Kingston wells, we have very few wells over here, but even there are very few wells, the green dots, you can usually actually use 10 limestone wells and 39 alluvium wells of which four are active. And a study which was done with Dr. Gordon Smith and an EMPHIL student for our thesis as well as paper just to do show the, uh, we did a detailed water quality, but I'll show you the water level variations. The deepest aquifer is in the center, in the alluvium well, in the center where the dark green wells are, and you have the shallow in the, um, along the coastal. So the limestone and alluvium wells are shown over here. All these wells are not, not all of them are active. Only a few wells are active. Now Kingston faces drought and the impacts of drought are shown in the variation. The first drought is in 2009, where you see very low level of late rainfall. And then in 2010, no very minimum rainfall, which then led to the severe drought. And because of the drought, the low month, this was all from Met Office data, very low rainfall in the drought years, which caused a decrease in the flow in the Yala. So in the 2009, the first drought Jamaica faced after a long period of time, the first El Nino season, you'll see the river go very low. The discharge is very low over here. And that caused the higher drought in the interior and all along the South Coast. Same again in 2015. So things, this is going to repeat again if you have two, three uh, months, six, four months of no rainfall, you're going to go back to the drought phase again. And with the current wells being contaminated with nitrate, high level of nitrate. So these are the wells which were sampled in Kingston. So we have limited resource, drought affecting and groundwater contamination, Kingston Basin gets stressed out. Very high levels of uh, lead, I'm sorry, nitrate and chloride. Nitrate is more in the uh, wells which are along the coast and in the interior, that's the well near um, St. Devon House. And the, those wells were sampled. So we use climate model data to generate stream flows for the Rio Cobre. And we were doing for um, Kingston too. We use the modeling tool SWOT uh, to simulate the rainfall runoff for the upper and lower Cobre. I'm going to show you the results. So this is the Rio Cobre water, uh, watershed. It has several Rio Cobre basin with three, four with watershed, sub watersheds units in it. We are only looking at the upper and lower Rio Cobre. The picture of the basin is on the right hand side. And the rivers which are draining into, in, you have the gorge at the center, and then you have the lower Rio Cobre. So we are just looking at the upper and lower, not on the others, not on the salt salt island and not the coal burn scully because they don't drain, they do not drain um, into the eastern side and there is they are not contributing to any water possibility of taking for to the Kingston Basin. So you're restricted to the upper and lower Rio Cobre. 
rainfall variations, um, upper and low, lower Rio Cobre from the stations, showing the cyclical trend. Then we did the SWOT model. Now, what is SWOT? SWOT is a GIS-based hydrological model. It uses the basic surface topography. From that, you isolate your um, DEM. From that, you isolate your watersheds. And then you overlay your soil and land use for each watershed. You enter your rainfall data. And you run the model in time steps of daily, monthly, to yearly. And you get predicted stream flows. So your input data is the DEM, then you have soil and land use, rainfall data. And from that, you can isolate the different catchments, the stream networks, the watershed. So again, the quality of the base data should be very good to get correct results. So using the Rio Cobre, the steps you see here started with the DEM, then did the HRU analysis response units. And finally, we get the river systems and the outlets of the, which are the junction points of the streams where the flow is to be determined. Now the top picture which you see here are the grid boxes over the island. This is 25 kilometer um, resolution from climate studies group. And on the, on the, the picture you see from the metro, meteorological stations, uh, which are on the upper and Rio Cobre. Now, if we look here, there is a spatial resolution challenge because when you're modeling using station data and you're modeling using climate data. So we use the future climate data. So Rio Cobre, if you look, is grid box 5, 13, and a little bit of 14. So the numbers over there, so we use the gridded data. So for each grid, you get one rainfall and one temperature. Unlike from, for every, day you get one day, one rainfall. So grid 14 will give you day one, one day value, but grid 14 can comprise of two, three stations. The statistical downscaling part has not been done. So we are just doing the, showing the grid results. And we are estimating the future flow for the specific sections of the river. That's the spots where the stream flow is. On the left, you have the rainfall data for the different RCPs and in the blue line is the station rainfall data. So all the stations which you see here, this work was done from the state of the Jamaica climate 2019. It's not yet published. It's, it's in press by PIOJ, it's for PIOJ, done with collaboration with CSGM. So that's the rainfall trend, the station data and the blue, yellow and all those lines are the RCP data. So all of them are showing a decreasing trend, but I mentioned here, one is station, one is grid box. So there will, they will not be identically same. So there will be a, <coughs> sorry, difference in the, in, the, in, the, in the data set when you calibrate. So you use the rainfall data. So I ran the, we ran the model myself and my PhD student, Melissa, we ran the model with the, rainfall data station, as well as with the future climate data. So it was done separately. And on the right, you see the trend in the stream flows. We have daily, but we compiled it to show you yearly. Grid one and grid two is basically upper and low, lower Rio Cobre. So we are seeing a decrease in the trend in both the station data run derived model, model historical on the top, you see model yellow and the that is the climate model historical, 1960 to 1990. And the blue line on the left is the model flows from station data that is 1985 to 2018. So it is similar, but of course, the stations in Jamaica are not consistent with data throughout. You have gaps in the data. So overall, the trend is the same, but they will not be exactly the same because of the spatial resolution. And the Lines you see from 2020 to on 2020 100 are the future climate stream flow trends. There is a decrease till mid century. Then one RCP, that is RCP 2.6, is showing an increase in flow, and then there is again a decrease. So if the stream flows are going up and down, it means that your water level in the river will get affected. And if you are using the water for potable water or irrigation, it will your supply will thus get affected. And I must say, this is the first time 
we are doing running a hydrological model based on climate model data. It was done before, but not our modeling was done. It was done predicted that if rainfall decreases by 10% and 10% decrease in or 20% stream flow. But here we have actually gone in and run the model. So I skip this slide. And that was to the surface. And next we are looking at the floods and I'm almost in time. So I will skip through some of them. So floods is again, the other extreme too much water. Now we are all doing hazard risk assessments. My part was to do the flood hazard assessment, not the risk part yet. So once you look at the flood hazards, a natural phenomena, we look at the hazard and the vulnerabilities, how strong your buildings are, where they are located. Are you building on a flood plain? Are you building near the bank of the river? Then of course you will be in risk. So we did, and if you look at the global hazards, flooding is the major hydrometeorological hazard as after that comes storm. So what are the main factors? Rainfall, distance from the stream, if you're looking at riverine flooding, bedrock geology, of course, soil properties, land cover, land elevation, the slope steepness, slope aspect, flow direction, all of that was used to create, estimate the flood hazard. And flooding in Jamaica doesn't have to restrict itself to presence of storms. These days, if you have a rain of two days, it gets flooded up. But these are some of the major storms that have impacted the island. Gilbert, then there was a big gap. Then you have Ivan Dean. And this is again, a recent compilation till until 2020, all the storms and hurricanes that have impacted and the floods. And we are seeing that there is an increasing trend of course, the bimodality is following the rainfall pattern. We have also added the landslide data because landslide, although it's, a hydrolog it's not a hydromet event, but it is related to hydromet. It is geological hazard, but in Jamaica, 90% of the landslides are rainfall induced and not so much of earthquake induced. So those are landslides compiled from data we got from different agents, MGD, OTPEM, and Gleaner archives and we try to see when you get the maximum. And the last decade, there is a trend. In so 2010, 2000 to 2010, there is an increase in the number of hurricanes and tropical storms. The last one was 2012, Hurricane Sandy, and then you had tropical storm Eta and Zeta, 2020 back to back, which we know caused some of the damages. Some pictures from familiar pictures to everyone. That's Tropical Storm Nicole, August, um, Gustav, Port Maria, Port Maria again. That's in Yalas, Port Maria Mount. And where is this? It's a question. Its road is fixed. So that's a clue. This is in Gordon Town. Last year, November, personal pictures taken when a few of us went up and took looked at the landslide. That's the Gordon Town Road, and it was outer band of tropical storm Eta, I think, yes, late October, November. And so if you look at the flooding, there are different types. You have groundwater induced depression, again, based on the location where it is and the type of geology and the source. So if you are in the groundwater terrain, depression flooding, if you are in a Eastern side and you're in the central, in, I mean, if you are in the aquiclode, you get riverine flooding. The variables that were used to create the first-hand flood hazard map was to use the locations of riverine floods. So you have 300 flood points, you have 300 non-flood points you select. You select the different variables, geology, land cover, soil type, and you find the spatial relationship of these variables with flooding. We did it in GIS and we used uh, statistics on top of it, and we created the flood hazard map. This will show you which area, and we see that they are mostly common with the uh, predicted areas where you get flooding. Next, we looked at the impact of climate change, and this is the last few slides on selected rivers. Hope River, very common site. Yalas River in St. Thomas, going all the way up to Saint, Upper St. Andrew. Well, Mavis Bank, I think you cross from Hope to Yalas. As far as I remember, that's the watershed boundary. 
uh, you guys can correct me. And so this is the Hope River in Kingston, St. Andrew, and that's the Yalas from St. Thomas. We modeled the lower section of the Yalas River because that is the floodplain actually starts from a little bit below Rambo. That's where the intake point is. Intake of the water to come to the Mona Reservoir. The pipeline actually starts from near Rambo. And those dots you see over there are the building footprints and most of, well, I don't need to tell you, but you see people are living on the river bank. Whether the GIS plots it, whether you go, people should not be living where they are living. No amount, I mean, it's going beyond my topic. But yes, people are living on the river bank. People are living on the floodplains and they are already living in a danger zone. All the top areas, you will get mostly landslides, but where the lower section, where it is mainly the middle and lower coast, you have the flooding. And the left picture is hydrological model output from head. head. So we use the hydrological model, we use the rainfall data for specific storms, and we then use the hydraulic flood model, list flood to create the floodplain map. Heck HMS is also an open source hydrological model in. The data that goes in is your DEM, the rainfall data, soil, land use, and what do you get out of it? You get your flow out at locations you want. So if you want your flow downstream of a property, of a development you want to do, you use a drainage analysis and you want to find out the flow at that specific point, you do that with a model because you don't have gauging stations at every location in the riverbed channel. So we did that, we saw a flood level of four meters, maximum flood depth in uh, Yalas, pretty much very narrow, but majority, the, the extent is wider at the mouth because the channel is flat and obviously it will be more. Then we looked at the Yal, um, Hope River and we used several storms, uh, hurricanes. We selected a specific track, so if, let's say, if I want a track of a hurricane to move in this direction, what will be the rainfall if the storm starts from the first pinpoint and then goes on the other? And you let the storm propagate and you get future rainfall data for each grid box. And once you get the future rain from that, from that storm, it can be used for forecasting. And what will be the flow just north of so? Okay, this is the bridge at Kintyre, the fording that collapsed. Now, what is the amount of water that can cause the fording to collapse? There's no gauging station immediately upstream. So we need modeling to get to that stage. So that is why these locations, outlet A and B, are selected upstream of the point where the damage is, because all the water from there is coming down through the narrow channel and flooding it out. So what is the flow at outlet A and outlet B if your storm is selected at a specific rate? We selected a storm of 17 and 25 kilometer, hypothetical. We selected our arrow and we made it move and we get different flow from the model. So if your storm moves at 17, this will be the flow of water. And you can then say, um, sorry, you can also, sorry, this is the time to peak. So you can tell people, hey, you have a time of 14 hours to move from this point. That's a long time indeed, uh, depending on um, from where the start to end point. So you can do future hypothetical situations like let's say, and this can aid in disaster management as well, because for 370, if a storm is at 17 kilometers, at outlet A, which is just upstream of this gorge, the flow peak flow is about 370 at, um, and then it be showing here B for the 25. So fast moving storm will have a shorter time, but a higher volume. And the last part is the started long and ended finally, is to see the impact of 1.5 versus two and 2.5 temperature on flooding in watershed in Jamaica. We selected the Hope watershed. And for this, it started all, um, we did some river channel cross sections from a project which we had done, which was in 2012. So we, those lines you see on the map, the horizontal lines, those are cross-section lines, meaning physically going in the field, hiring a surveyor to get the channel cross-section. 
because when you're doing hydraulics, your channel geometry is very important. A one meter difference in elevation can throw away that uh, data, it's not accurate. So the DEM was not very good near the channel. So that is why for the hydraulics, we did the channel survey. So we started from the Alberga bridge and went to Groove where the gauging station is, then went to the fording all along to the mouth of the river. And the red 100 year floodplain boundary is what WR is. So we looked at these same outlets, but we looked at now rainfall data from the RCP scenarios for a 1.5 change in temperature, for a two degree change in temperature, and for a 2.5. So it was a combined approach of hydrological and hydraulic modeling, estimating peak flows for past events, which we did before for Nicole and Gustav, and for future scenarios to see if flooding will remain the same or will increase, and if yes, what will be the extent. So again, we use gridded data. Hope River covers the climate grid 20, and it's a numbers from the, I didn't make these numbers, these are numbers which are from the climate group. And we use the rainfall from there, fed into the model, ran the hydrological model, got the flows, input into the cross sections, ran the hydraulic model. So you have 1.5 and you have one 2.5. So we have different temperatures, Note this is from 20, it's a long year, it's 2019 uh, to 2099, end of century, but divided into 30 years based on when there is a temperature change of 1.5 and 2 and 2.5. So it was, it is a little bit of time taking work. The extents remain the same, a slight increase in flood depth up to six meet, meters in 2.5 follows the current flood plane and those points are building footprints and you are seeing where the footprints are with respect to your flood extent. So that is all what you have been doing in this department over the different number of years that I'm here. So climate projections are all showing the RCP scenarios for surface water was showing a decrease in trend, which means it will affect your availability the flood is showing that there is an increase in peak flow and we will still continue to have flood risk. Must take the following measures. That is ensure flood control, issue messages for people to evacuate when, as and when needed, build no build zones, have no build zones enforced strictly and proper land use management. Don't build on slopes that are easy to fall off. If you know there's a landslide, fix it properly. And if you can't fix it, then don't go and build on top of it again, because it does cause a big damage to GDP. And these are all the people who have supported me over the through funding and the different data sources. And it's a collaborative work. And I end it over here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandel. That was a very rich presentation, lots to unpack. Um, there is so much that we heard. We got Jamaica characterized for those of you who are students joining in. We were able to learn a little bit about Jamaica, the hydrological underpinnings, the geology. And of course, then we ended with applications, the modeling. We've looked at past events. We've looked at using the information from those events and putting it into models, um, climate models. So it was a lot. Um, I'm, where do we start? Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions and comments and it's just for me to open the floor and ask persons to um, indicate if they wish to say anything. But first, my thanks for a very, very full and rich presentation. Is there anyone who wishes to um, speak now? Okay, Dr. David Smith from ISD, I see your hand. You may go ahead. Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. You're a little bit low. Can you turn up your volume? Uh, let me see. Um, is this better? Much yes, better. Sir, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, one of the things that struck me was that in all of this good work, you are, are Peter working with large numbers of individuals. And you know, in 
back in the day, academics were always told, you know, you've got to do your individual work and uh, publish your own papers. How would you, how important to, is this work within a team? And do you think that that is likely to continue to be the way that good um, academic work is done? Definitely. Definitely, especially in our field, in, I mean, in all our public, our means in geosciences, physical sciences, you see papers in chemistry, physics, life science, geology, you have a lot of co-authors, at least two to three co-authors, because it's not possible for me to generate climate model and run the model. It's not possible for me to do water quality testing as, a, as my colleague here would be uh, used, uh, giving best results. So it is collaborative work. I mean, teamwork is always good. And, and now, as you know, as, you, as we see, that is, it is a mixture of physical and human social sciences as well, because this data needs to go to somebody else who can apply it, right? So I will continue to work in groups. And the way my work is, it will need group work. So. Um, yes, it is definitely needed. We need to collaborate, especially in applied field. Because if someone, and also in geology, if you're doing geological mapping, somebody may be very good in mapping, but I am not good in mapping. And I don't want to go into all those deep bushes to map. So I need the map and the solid information from someone who is expert in it. So I take it and I then apply it to where, whether you want to find water, whether you want to find um, minerals or whatever, I think it is, and in geology, we've always done that. That's, that's my answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you, Dr. Mandal, for your response. I'm just checking if there's anybody else that wishes to um, make a comment or has a question at this time. Um, Checking Simon. Simon, Simon and Michael. So um, I'm actually going to give um, Dr. Byrne the first nod and then um, uh, Professor Mitchell can go after. No problem. Thanks, Thera, and thanks, Arpita, for a fabulous talk. Um, so a lot of that material I've not, I've not, I was not aware of, so it's really filled in oh. some gaps uh, oh. for me. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sure, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, Peter, I wonder what your thoughts are. You, you made at the very beginning of your uh, presentation, you talked about the importance of the data that goes into all of these models. Um, and obviously the IPCC uh, output has significant uncertainties associated with their projections of future uh, climate change. Uh, one of those uncertainties, as you'll be aware, is, is the importance of El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, and we know, of course, that that has significant impacts on our weather patterns here in the Caribbean. Um, and of course, uh, nobody has yet been able to project what is likely to happen to ENSO over the next 50 to uh, 100 years. Uh, and so I, I wonder how the community uh, will be able to start thinking about incorporating kind of future projections of ENSO in terms of understanding you know, future rainfall patterns and then that, how that impacts on your uh, hydrological um, models as well. Yes, very, very important. Um, thanks, Mike. And uh, first on the data source. Um, although I myself run these models, but I would like to say that there is a lot of uncertainty because simple, you are using a 25 kilometer grid, or if you go down further to 10 and you are running it for a small island or where you have a, and a watersheds where one grid box covers the entire watershed, right? As we have seen. But in reality, rainfall is varying. In, even in the Hope watershed, if you look, rainfall is high in Mavis Bank and low at the mouth of the river. So if we, there is a spatial. So the first thing would be to, to improve these models will be to downscale all that grid data to station level. And then to see what is the difference, which is also something like bias correction, or when the rainfall data, now I get the future rainfall data only from the climate model group. So maybe there, there, there will have to be station downscaling or uh, bias corrected with the historical data. 
And also, if you see the historical data, there is a gap. There's a gap in the data. So there are some, this, and regarding the ENSO, I think they are working on it. I'm not 100% sure on the updates of the modeling at the moment going on, but myself, I have tried to look at, um, from my sabbatical, when I was on my sabbatical, I went up to Canada and I started looking at this little piece of work, which is, what are the drivers of the rainfall in the in Jamaica? So what it was, it's similar to a study done in Canada. What they were doing is to see the 24 hour annual maximum and running regression with it, with uh, rain, uh, like location of the station, distance from the river, distance from the coast, uh, wind, and also I was suggested to use the AMO and ENSO. So that is still there, but um, I cannot say 100% at the moment if what, what we are going, we are good, we are, I'm trying to see that part, but I have not finished it, but it's good, you can see it. But I am agreeing, I have, I have restrictions with this spatial thing, the grid versus station, that is a challenge. I myself, even though I run this, I myself have concern with this. How, how accurate are these future stream flow predictions? How accurate are these future uh, flow flood levels? Because we have a spatial difference, 10, 25 versus one station. Thanks, Sir Peter. It's, it's a really challenging thing to do. And I think as you said, also said at the beginning is you have to do the best with what you have. And, and that clearly is what you guys have done. Um, and it would be now interesting to see if, if over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, you know, we can incorporate the ENSO component and the AMO component as well to see how that affects all of those uh, future projections as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, you see the ENSO and AMO data I got from the, and you, you very well know the data. So the, from, the, from the NOAA, the different website, the site, that is, I thought it would be station. There is no, it's just um, island level data, right? It's a uh, grid data. So you would have to, it's a lot of, I don't know, you are in, 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 in the parish, of, in the watershed of Rio Cobre, you have 15 or 20 stations, but the AMO or ENSO, for, you get one or two values for that, for that box, and you have two grid boxes. So that is a bit of uncertainty, quite a bit of uncertainty. So maybe the next step would be to run these models by down, tell by the downscale rainfall from the climate model and see the difference. Maybe that would be my next step if, if I do it. <laughs> and the historical part, I just want to make sure tell that Jamaica's station data goes as far as 1985, but the climate model daily rainfall is 1960 to 1990. So there is some years where there is overlap, just if you want to calibrate the climate model rainfall with the historical rainfall with the station historical rainfall. There are gaps where there is, gap, there is a gap in that oh, year to year matching is also difficult. I mean, I mean, we don't have the data. Yes, Simon. Simon, Simon your question. Oh, okay. Hey, um, yeah, I was just thinking, um, I mean, what you presented is really quite technical. Mm, um, I, that, I do. And the, you know, the actual sort of outcomes from it, whether it's the fact we're getting drier or whether the fact we're going to get worse floods or whatever you want to put down there, um, is obviously something that, um, you know, average citizens in Jamaica would probably be interested in. How yes. do you think you can actually bring the science to a level where they can understand and you can inform them? Okay, we have, uh, during the project periods, we have done workshops and stuff to tell people that, okay, these areas will get flooded. But in simple layman terms, giving Kingston as an example, whether climate change hits or not, whether we go into all these complicated model thing, if you keep building, if you go on increasing urbanization and cut down the green spaces and do not improve the drainage and the rainfall is going up, the same roads will get flooded. 
sections of Kingston where you experience flooding, such as Marcus Garvey Drive, such as our own Hook Road. I don't want to mention roads and names and scare people, but places where flooding is going on will go on if the land use is not properly managed. We have to restrict. And, the, and also we should not be but obviously people are not hearing the message because we're still getting all this planning going on. Uh, going I am on. not so a, yes, but I what know, can I? but how do we get how do we get a message out there? Because getting a message out there is one of the important things that has to be done. Um, we've been very successful in other things about warning people against hurricanes, even about making people wary when earthquakes happen. But these other things, long term climate changes which are going to affect livelihoods as well as actual individual properties. I mean, in right. terms of being able to do agriculture and things, right. we need to be in a situation where we can actually um, communicate to this to the people so that they can actually understand it and so that they are actually aware of it. And when something happens, they can say, oh, this is something that we were told about and we can see that this is happening. But that, you know, Simon, there is a gap always. No matter how many presentations or workshops or flyers or things you issue, the, the agencies who are responsible for these, they will have to, at some point, restrict building on slopes that are already failing. I mean, you pass across uh, along a road and there's a landslide. And a few years back, you see something coming up and people building houses on it. It is very simple. It's directly in front of your eyes. Hope River, people are on the riverbed. People are on the riverbed. And when you go there, and the common people know, when you go there for next, okay, next I get a uh, go and in the field, they will tell me this is happening over the years. We know it, but I guess that's beyond my hands to control. <laughs> I still think it is, again, one of the things that, we're, you know, as scientists, we have to try and make our message heard, even if it means that you have to shout a lot and it's not heard very often. But I think it's one of the very important ways of going forward. Yeah. One of the things we cannot say is that the work has not been done, um, because certainly from what we heard today is that there has been a lot of work um, in different parts of Jamaica, St. Mary, Rio Mino, Rio Cobre, um, Hope River. So the work is being done and um, the information is available. And that has been the contribution of Dr. Mandel and her various colleagues, both from Jamaica and institutions overseas. So we do have um, the contributions to the knowledge. Um, and we've had one of our highest um, turnouts this afternoon in terms of audience and so certainly the word is going out, um, might be to the choir, but um, we've had people tuning in and listening. Um, I'm just gonna do one well, final check. I, I can say one thing, Tira. Uh, this is a full academic audience over here, except Mr. Pennant. <laughs> but no, a lot of us he's know that- He's still a that... technical person. He's still technical, he's still technical staff. So I that's can why I'm see. the choir. And I, I don't know, it's not a, if it's too diplomatically, I should say, or, okay, let it <laughs> have to be diplomatic. So saying diplomatically is when a new project is, is, uh, is done or undertaken, I suggest, well, I'm not here to suggest anything to the organ donors, but I would be happy if the technical people are consulted to format the project. Sometimes it's, Repetitive work going on. And you may have seen, and all of us know, there are big reports, there are papers sitting on the chair, sitting on the shelves. And that is what is black. We have to improve the data to tell the people not to live on X meters from the river. And that you cannot do in a run in a two-month crash project. You need Scientific research, These we have the Rio Mino work which went for two years because every three months people had to go and collect the data. So water quality, one off cannot work. We have to have continuous and we need to stop at some point the repetitive work that is, sometimes happens over the years. 
I don't know if it's, well, if the work stops, then I don't get the work. So it's a do double thing too, but, uh, well, point the new job, yeah. The point so is taken. Um, there, is, there is a lot of um, reinventing of wheels that goes on. And there are some projects which don't permit the kind of first-hand data collection that is needed. And we have to use best available information um, instead of getting um, new information that would improve the work. And it, 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 it is a reality. Um, so I just wanted to note from the chat that Dr. Donovan Campbell um, expressed his pleasure and congratulated you for your presentation today, but he was posted in the chat. Thank um, you. So, yes, I saw it. Right. So, but I wanted to, to acknowledge it and um, to say we're over time. Yes. And to thank everyone who has come today and listened in and shared with the department. As you can see, our brown bags are only getting better by the week. And we look forward to hosting you next week, Thursday, for yet another presentation. And to just to say thanks again to Dr. Mandel for a very engaging, fulsome um, presentation today and to all the persons who attended. Thank you so much on behalf of the Department of Geography and Geology. Thank you. Mm -hmm.